Um, so what is a slime mold? Has anybody heard of slime mold before? One hand, two hands, no. three, okay, four. Any other four? four. Okay, so um, Stephen Johnson in his book on emergence, uh, which is a very, very readable book that relates these different emergent systems, so from slime molds to ant colonies to the city to the World Wide Web, um, I recommend that as a, as a good point if, you, if you're interested in these interconnected systems and emergent properties. He says that in trying to understand systems that use relatively simple components to build higher level intelligence, the slime mold may someday be seen as the equivalent of the finches and tortoises that Darwin observed on the Galapagos Islands. That's quite some statement. You know, Darwin's observations you know, created the, the, the whole theory of evolution, but his observations of, you know, kind of diversity of species populations um, and looking at the kind of changes through sort of evolutionary shifts. So this is quite some statement that slime mold might be seen as important in understanding these systems that start from very simple elements but that complex, uh, higher level intelligence emerges. Um, so what is a slime mold? I'm going to spend about 20 minutes introducing you to this organism um, and then we'll do uh, a situated activity kind of from thinking about slime mold. So, uh, slime mold um, is this, the, there are many different species of slime molds. The one we'll be focusing on is Physerum polycephalum, and that polycephalum, many heads, is a, is a direct translation. So this is the many-headed slime mold. It's a single-celled organism, so it's just a cell, but it collects together with other cells of its kind to form a mass supercell. So within a slime mold, you may have thousands or millions of individual nuclei, so the nucleus of the cell, but they're all working together and sharing um, the cell membrane. In its natural habitat, it likes living in woodland. So if you walk through the forest, particularly in autumn, fall time, uh, turn a rotting log, then you'll find a little yellow gloopy thing, sometimes white, sometimes pink, they're different colored ones. Um, so they, they live on the forest floor. Um, they used to be thought of as a mushroom, but they're not, they're not part of the fungi family. They're actually the Mebozoa, if you're interested in biological uh, kingdoms. Um, and they're not mold, so they're, they're, but it's, they are a bit slimy. So they have an interesting name. Um, it's nomadic, so it has no roots. It, um, so it's not plant, it's not animal, it's not fungus. It's uh, its own kind of kingdom that's being formed. This is slime mold having decided that it's exhausted this environment and it's escaping its petri dish. And one of the slime molds here is also doing the same. That's why I'm saying it's, it's quite hungry. <laughs> it's bit bored by the petri dish that I've given it. Um, so I'm going to pass this one around. It doesn't like the light, which is why it's in. Um, container and I've taken away its food but if you're very careful try to avoid this corner because it is escaping um, but I'll pass this around so you can see and maybe you'll notice something about the way it behaves as to why we're using it as a model organism in a fluid rhythms urban networky kind of setting so have a little look pass it around um, so it's, it's a nomadic creature it, um, it constantly exploring, very curious um, around its, its environment. Um, as an artist, I work with it as biological material. Um, I, kind of, it, I grow it, I capture it through photography and time-lapse imaging, um, set it challenges and tasks to do, um, produce prints and films, but also other kinds of modeling um, activities. So this is a time-lapse of it exploring a maze Soundtrack. So observe its behaviour, it's kind of pushing out from the centre, exploring, adapting its kind of growth pattern to its environment. And this may be, as I said, millions of individual nucleus, nuclei operating together in this kind of branching patterns. And we see these kind of patterns across all scales in nature. I mean, what does it remind you of? Just shout out a few other kinds of similar patterns. Rivers. Rivers, roots, roots trees. trees. Anything else? Cities. 
cities. Blood vessels. Blood yeah. vessels, yeah, within our own bodies. We have blood vessels up there. Like yes, yeah. Lightning strikes. Nerves. Nerves, yeah. So, yeah, across all sorts of species scales, we, we see this kind of pattern. It's very efficient pattern within the natural systems. Um, the reason that it's exploring a maze, this is my homage to a, a classic scientific experiment in 2000. And one, um, a group in Japan filled a, slime, a maze with slime mold. They had introduced food at two points, and the slime mold left the uh, empty areas of the maze and formed a route between the food sources. So, what it does is it networks between nodes, between food nodes. So, when it's exploring, it will branch out, but when it finds food, it will lock onto that food and form a network between them. So, you can see. So going from being, being full, the foods here, it, starts, it rationalizes, reduces its network, and over time, it found the shortest and the most efficient route through the maze. So there are four possible routes that Simon could have taken, but time and again it found this, the shortest and most efficient route through the maze. And the conclusion in this scientific paper was that the slime mold demonstrated a primitive form of intelligence. Um, an intelligence used with something that is just a single cell this organism has no brain, no sensory organs, no central nervous system. It is just a bag of cells working together. So intelligence is a very problematic term in scientific circles and has been much debated since. And we can, we can discuss how we define intelligence in these kind of systems. Um, another experiment which explored the networking capacity the slime mold, if we have a look at, at this, the slime mold starts off at an area um, in the middle. These are food nodes around it. Its favourite food is porridge oats. <laughs> this will be significant later. Um, and so they've placed oats around it and, it, and as it branches out, when it finds the, the food, it locks on, forms a network, and over time it establishes a network here. Does anybody recognise what kind of geographic area that is. This is Tokyo. So this is the, the southeast peninsula of Japan. Um, these are the main towns around the Tokyo. So the slime mold replicated the Tokyo rail network um, to a point of about 97% accuracy. So if you overlay the slime mold map on top of the actual human built Tokyo transport system, it's highly accurate. So all the, all the transport uh, designers and urban developers in, in, in Tokyo and Japan are thinking, great, we did a really good job. <laughs> the slime mold agrees with our design. Where it does deviate is when there's a man-made imposition. So there's a really large um, castle that's got a big wall around it, um, where in human, human terms has to go around, but the slime mold doesn't have that kind of imposition. So when there are deviations from the actual map, there's usually a, a, a valid reason. Um, so the slime mold is a very efficient networker. It will form these efficient networks between nodes. And um, so mathematicians are really interested in what, what is the kind of underlying biological algorithm that's driving this network optimization. Um, and from this experiment, slime mold has mapped the world. If you want to spend some time on YouTube, um, you can get lost down a rabbit hole of slime mold mapping. Um, so transport routes are very popular, highways, railways, um, shipping routes, drug trafficking routes, migration routes, evacuation from building routes, you name it, the slime mold has mapped it. What it hasn't done yet, which is something that I'm trying to work on, but the funding hasn't followed yet, is to use the slime mold as part of the design team prior to this systems being built. At the moment it's, it's kind of tested existing networks, um, but I'd I, I want to see the day where the slime mold is part of the design team. Um, so a lot of people have, see, have seen this thing as a biological computer. A huge number of computer scientists uh, are working with it, trying to you know, use kind of the, the, the mathematical properties within the organism and applying those to kind of microelectronics, robotics, um, and kind of particle modeling systems. Um, just to give you a couple of examples, so this is a digital simulation of the, of the Tokyo experiment, the, the digital slime mold 
its character of behavior is slightly different, but the optimization uh, network operates the same. Um, and this is Jeff Jones, a UK scientist, uh, works for the Center for Unconventional Computing um, in Bristol. Um, and so we see this kind of optimization network efficiency evolving through those nodes. On the right, we have a robot controlled by a slime mold. So this has got a, a transistor in the, in the robot that has a live slime mold growing on it. There are light sensors. The slime mold doesn't like light, so when it senses the light, it grows away from it, and that affects the direction of the robot. So it's, you know, it's biologically interesting um, in, in its kind of natural habitat, but as a model organism, biologically and computationally, it's, it's very interesting. Um, and, a, and a huge number of researchers from very different fields are working with it. So you have you know, biologists, biophysicists, biochemists uh, working with it. Because it is, it, its mechanism, how it kind of can understand its environment, is chemical. So it's chemotaxic, which means it picks up on chemical signals in its environment. Um, and that's how it kind of builds, builds an understanding of what's going on around it. Um, when I'm interested in it, as it's sort of biologically, computationally, and socially. Um, this is uh, working with the simulation of the slime mold. This is an interactive piece. So a motion sensor picks up the place of people and translates them to food nodes on screen. So we become virtual oats. Um, and then as we move, the slime mold networks between us. So we're trying to work out which oat we are and, and try to escape the slime mold. Um, incidentally, the people in the uh, image are two filmmakers and me. Um, filmmakers who made a feature-length documentary called The Creeping Garden. So this is a, a documentary film all about slime mold um, and different people who are working with it. So it includes myself as an artist, uh, computational scientists, roboticists, musicians, um, and there's a lot of kind of history of time lapse photography and kind of nature filming and stuff in there. So if you're interested in finding out more, I recommend the Creepy Garden. There is a book as well. So we can think of the slime mold as an information distribution system um, without a brain. So here we can see this started off with several kind of cells that navigate the environment and uh, join up together. This is a time lapse from a collaboration I did with Ecologic Studio, who are an urban design and conceptual design studio in London. And this was reimagining the peninsula of, of Tallinn. This was for a Tallinn Architectural Biennale. And the, cent the site of interest was a peninsula that had uh, it, it was a natural, kind of natural habitat and preservation of that area, but also waste management, uh, kind of weather patterns, migratory birds. So you had different uh, perspectives and priorities kind of in, in conflict or um, in, in that, that area. And that became a site of interest for this urban design. This one, I mean, you, yeah, you can probably see the kind of networked behavior. This is slightly messy because I took food out. It had oats in it earlier, and this morning I took them out so that it would be rare to go. I didn't think it would be quite that rare to go. <laughs> So this is it traversing that same landscape, but from a different level. And it's seeking moisture, it's, you know, its priorities are moisture, so it will keep to the kind of low ground, um, it's you know, seeking food. But you can see this is all kind of one organism distributed in multiple directions, hence the name many-headed. So from the branching behavior, so you can see here, some, some part of it is still searching, but this has kind of settled and formed a network. And you, can you see that pulsing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this, that's, that's the information channels, the flow. Okay, so if you think of this, we watched that kind of pulsing at, at macro scale. If we look at it under the microscope, um, you can see the particles inside this kind of breathing, pulsing, so it has a vein-like structure which is constantly dynamic. So there's nothing fixed about the slime mold. Um, inside you, so the nuclei um, and kind of particles of food you can see shuttling through, through 
through the system. Let everyone see from where they are the kind of detail. So all these kind of granular. So it means that because you've got such a simple organism, it's just made up, that's, you know, what you see is what you get. It's just it's cytoplasm that's responding chemically to its environment. But because the information about its environment is distributed so efficiently within that network, you can have quite a, a big cell, but it's, the information is constantly flowing. So, I mean, in terms of fluid rhythm, emotion, this is, you know, this is why the slime mold is, is here. It's, it's, it is this you know, flowing information system. Um, all parts of the cell are in synchronous harmony. Um, its pace will change, depends, so that pulsing will change its frequency depending on what it's found, whether it's found something good or bad, or if it runs out of resources, it will slow down. So time and pace will, will change. So as well as being able to optimize networks, there, there's um, an evidence, so you know, kind of from scientific research, that it has memory. It has two types of memory. It has kind of spatial memory. It will kind of leave um, a, a membrane around it to indicate where it's been. And it has temporal memory as well. It can anticipate events. It can hold a kind of a pattern, a repeat pattern um, in, its, in its membrane and change its behavior in anticipation of event. Um, it can also recognize itself. So in this, so having fed on a nice pile of oats, it goes off exploring two directions simultaneously. So this is still one supercell connected through the oats. When it meets itself, it pauses, it retreats, leaving its kind of membrane indication, and then goes off into another area. So this kind of mapping, it has an internal mapping system. You can see that the residual trace that's left behind it, um, that holds a chemical information that means the slime can recognize where it's been. Um, so it kind of knew that that was itself, so it didn't join, otherwise it would have caused a, a kind of continuous feedback loop. So that means that this, you know, that, that information was being distributed across that scale of, um, of the network. Um, the last one I want to kind of share with you is an interspecies communication, and I want you to to look at this film, um, so this is two, two species of slime mold, Physarum polycephalum on the right, this is the one I tend to work with, the many heads one. On the left is a Danish cousin called Vidania. Just watch this and see if you can observe different strategies that the slime molds take. Also see the change in pulse sometimes, mm -hmm. change in frequency, kind of turning up the amplification a notch, and then we stop it there before it gets a little bit messy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, what what observations? So why does it choose us to, in my words, attack? Different species, and the wine doesn't go back to where the food is. Right? Yeah, they're basically safe and know that they can create a yeah. environment. 
<clears throat> so whilst this slime mould, Physeal and Polycephalum, its favourite food is porridge oats, but Darmian oh. doesn't like oats. Oh, oh. oh. just went straight over the oats. So that's first observation. One doesn't like the oats. So I think, yeah, just going back to the, the kind of the break from it, because it looked like a very clear, kind of even wall at one point. Um, I think we'd, you know, we'd have to kind of look at it again. Think of where it breaks, I think, is where it picks up on the chemical signal of the other organism. So it changes the frequency, and then the change in frequency between different parts of the cells then shifts the, the pattern. So when it's just moving forward at the same frequency, it moves as a kind of wall. When it picks up on different signals, um, so here you can see it's, it's coming into contact with either the, the other slime or ball, it's the slime or membrane, or as this is retreating, it, then the frequency changes, and so then you get a kind of break in the oscillation through the organism. Did anybody notice the, 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 the little deviant slime mold spy from the, the right hand one? Yeah. And we, so we had, this had a direct connection to mm -hmm. this approach. Um, and then this one's growing up here, and this is the wall. And then, yeah, so I'll just play this a little bit from here. Just notice this little thing here is part of this slime mold. Oh. Okay, so when it realised that this wall of yeah. com you know, the, the combatant Viking slime mold <laughs> was coming kind of towards it, it retreated. But it left a little island, oh. a little scout by its own polycephalum. And look how it's working around. Yeah. It's just completely hiding behind the oat from the other side. <laughs> but is it still connected to the bigger organism? No. Or they're totally separated? So now this is, now this is two, two slime molds oh. that have split. So early, I mentioned, yeah, it, it will choose when, the, when it is beneficial to be part of the collective and when it isn't. <laughs> and so when you break that system, this can still operate independently. Um, if we reintroduce them later, then they would most likely join again. Um, what we're going to do is just try to tune in to think, how would the slime mold respond to this? Um, so to recap, it doesn't like light. Um, it likes moisture. So dark and damp is its favorite environment. So, you know, if I'm working with it, in the studio, then I will you know, give it attractants, things that it likes, so that you know, in, in a studio environment that would be you know, oats or pasta, things you know, mm -hmm. that have a kind of high, high starch content it likes to sit on and digest. It doesn't like salt. Um, you don't need to worry too literally about that because we're not going to find salt in loads out there in the real world. But the point of the exercise is to think, okay, the slime mold responds to attractants and repellents. What might those be in the environment? Uh, from human terms, what do we find as an environmental attractant, or do, what do we find as a repellent? Um, what would the slime mold uh, think of as a, as a repellent or attractant? Um, we're going to set up, before we go out, we're going to set up a model for the slime mold navigate. Okay, I'm going to just tilt this up. It is Okay, so this is a slime mold friendly environment. This is the Bilma, or a section of the Bilma estate, which is how many of you know it's that way, isn't it? Yeah. Um, how many of you are local and know it? Have you, have, how many of you have been there as part of this workshop? Mm -hmm. The kind of classic shaped oh, houses. Mm -hmm. I think I've yeah. You've been on a walking tour? Okay. This is a beehive structure that they yeah. created. Yeah, so yeah, it's very be beehive, yeah. which is, which is mm. Mm. So I've covered it in agar. So it's like, you know, it's cooking agar, 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 jelly that you can cook with. Um, and I added the dark colour of the black, is I added a bit of squid ink powder to it. Um, so we've got a nice dark colour, which will contrast nicely with the uh, yellow. Aesthetics are very important for us. <laughs> um, but it also 
has a bit of nutrient in there as well. So before we go out, in the, in the store cupboard, there is a time-lapse set up, the camera and a light and a timer. Um, and I'm going to put a bit of slime mold in each corner. And whilst we're out exploring, the slime mold will be exploring its own new environment too. Okay, so, <laughs> so that's so that's one scale. So we'll set that up before we go. We're going to then explore the same area. And now you're going to work in groups of two or three. Each group of two or three is going to have two clipboards. Each clipboard has a map of the area, it's the same area with the hexagonal planes. So I think the slime mold map is squarer. It starts kind of there, goes to. Yeah, so it's kind of pretty much that bit up. Um, and we're going to explore the same area. You've got tracing paper, very sheets of tracing paper underneath as well, so you can place that on top. And we're going to walk around this area thinking as slime mould and thinking as humans. So we're going to do two maps. One slime mould, one human. What's attractant, repellent, how would you um, kind of move around the environment? Has anyone come across this term before? Umwelt. <laughs> would you like to define the umwelt? Relevant for environment, but literally it just means the world surrounding you. Mm. Oh. Bang on. <laughs> this retranslates as surrounding world. <laughs> you couldn't have been more accurate. Um, and do you know its origins? Okay, its origins are it's a term coined by German biologist Jakob von Uxkuhl, um, and it's to describe how each organism has its own subjective experience of its environment. Um, and his work established the field of biosemiotics. Um, I, some of you will have come across semiotics in your studies, if you're kind of graphics designers or communications people. Semiotics being the study of signs um, and symbols and how we can read those. So biosemiotics would be add life to that. So the study of signs and codes in life forms, in biological. Uh, um, so, yeah, if you think about from each different, you know, we talked about perspective shifting, but each organism has its own relationship to its environment. So we might share the same environment, but we have a completely different subjective relationship and experience of it. And this is what we're going to explore with this kind of idea of slime mold and human. What's a slime mold umwelt, and what's a human umwelt? So you know, any single environment contains many interrelating and interconnecting umwelts, layers of different subjective realities. And we've already you know, explored this in different terms. So you're going to think about, you know, from this designated area, so we'll all be exploring the same area, but in groups of two or three, how would the slime mold relate to its umwelt? What would it be attracted to or repulsed away from? What routes might it take between points? What would it do if it encountered other slime mold cells? Um, and then on your maps, mark key attractants, repellents, and then observations and encounters. So you can, you know, you can you're free to how you how you map it. But you might want to use a colour key um, or some kind of form of you know, creating symbols or signs on your map so that there's um, a kind of a way of understanding that. So. What are, when I, as I'm setting up the time lapse, you can organise groups of two or three and have a small discussion as to kind of what type of coding system you want to map your umwelts.